So I'd just like to remind you what we're doing, that we're doing Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. My coding is Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, or it's Mala. And it's counted method. Yoga, union. When we do the vinyasa and the mala style of counted method, I then call it transcendental ashtanga vinyasa yoga because yoga is meditation. So most of us end up getting into the colloquial speaking language. So the colloquial language of Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga is just Ashtanga Yoga. Ashtanga is the principles or the truths of yoga. So that's what I wanted to, to look at, is this little symbol here. These are lotus flowers. And these are the seeds of the lotus. So let me talk about how I get this a little bit. So we have Ashta, which is eight. And we have eight limbs. Eight steps. When I first heard the eight limbs or the eight steps, and you saw them, listed in the um, Light on Yoga from Mr. Iyengar, we had Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratihara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. So that's a very linear approach. And we can either list them that way or we can go Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratihara, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. We can list them. So Patanjali has a real habit of making lists of things. Within Yama is another five. Yeah. Within Niyama is another five. Okay. So things get sort of broken down into little categories. And just to remember that theory is a reductionist. We're reducing things to components and we've lost the union when we break things down. And that's what we tend to happen. We break things down to just ashtanga. We lose the union of the whole vinyasa yoga. When I first started, I thought it was like steps. Because my Guruji or Guruji said to me, you Westerner, first you start on the third limb, asana. And I'll refer you back to... Um, the matrix, the very first matrix. In the very first matrix, when Neo has been freed from the, the powerhouse and the, he's picked up by the Nebuchadnezzar, he then has all the, um, the acupuncture needles in him and all that sort of stuff. They rebuild him because he hasn't been using his muscles and he hasn't been using his eyes. And then he's ready to be 
put into his training. And he gets ready. Tank gets really excited. You're the one. This is going to be really excited. If what Morpheus says is true, and, and you're the one. I can't fight. This is going to be so exciting. So, so Tank is going to, to uh, do his training programs. And if you, if you really watch the movie in detail, as you have obviously see that I've watched it in detail because I've watched it many times, he has these little, little discs, programs, and he sort of like shuffles them. And he goes, one, two, three, or he goes, this is just boring uh, protocol shit. And then he comes up with combat training. He says, ah, combat training. The third limb. <laughs> this is just all protocol shit. Okay, this is all protocol shit. The do's and the don'ts and all that sort of stuff. And let's not bother with those. He said to me, you Westerner, you start on the third limb, asana. And then he said, then you go back. <laughs> so it's a little bit like when he said, You're, you start on the third limb, my ego was like, yeah. This is great. I don't need to do one and two. I'm promoted straight to three. And then when he said, but then you go back, it was sort of like the tall poppy had, had been chopped. So the ego goes, oh. So let me show you. I thought it was one, two, three going up and maybe samadhi. Maybe samadhi at the end of life practice, because this was a practice for life. So, meditation. Patabi Joyce didn't bother teaching you meditation. Because we weren't ready yet for meditation. He needed us to be sitting at least half an hour to do pranayama. We had to sit in Padmasana for half an hour before we'd be accepted to do pranayama. And so I didn't get to do pranayama with Patabi Joyce. All of my Padmasana sitting, I managed to get to half an hour and, bef and longer, but by that time, there was too many students and Patabi Joyce was too tired, and I missed out. And so I ended up doing my pranayama with Manju, with Patabi Joyce's son. But let's have a look at a different perspective. Let's look at this slightly different. I started to access from my feminine side that it wasn't linear, and it wasn't like a step. I wanted to call it the wheel of yoga. There was a, in England, there was a Hatha Yoga Foundation and they were called the wheel of yoga. And I really like that term, wheel of yoga, because for me a wheel symbolizes going forwards and going backwards and, and so, I, th I thought, well, let's make a wheel. And I divided the wheel into eight, like a clock. Later on, I found it in the Tibetan system. There is a, a wheel. We'll have a look at that a little bit later. And so for me, I went, oh, I'm going to put asana right at the top of my wheel, the third limb. Because that's where Patabi Joyce had me practicing at the beginning. So that would mean that this would be Yama and this would be Niyama. So let's have a look at another couple of words that you can find also in the matrix. And I'm going to look at cause and effect. So cause and effect. 
If we make asana a cause, so here this is, let's say, not asana posture. So Patabi Joyce called it the first 1% information I got from Patabi Joyce was posture. Can you fill out the rest of the saying for me? Posture. Free breathing. Free breathing. Looking place. So let's just watch this. Cause and effect. From learning posture, I also learned bandha. Structure. So if asana, posture, bandha, structure is the cause, the effect is free breathing. Free breathing. Or ujjayi. So we get pranayama. Just simply through learning to get structure and bandha in your posture, you're beginning to sit in asana or stand in asana. Your posture, your structure, your attitude changes the way you breathe. So now let's go cause and effect. Cause, effect. If we then look at pranayama or breathing, free breathing ujjayi, and make that a cause, what's the effect? Pratihara. In this sense, let's make it focus because Guruji called it looking place. So looking place, or we could call it drishti. So posture, free breathing, looking place. is actually asana, pranayama, and pratihara. So, remember the 99% the, the practice and 1% theory. We could say that this was 1%, this was 1%, this was 1%. Or we could call all of that 1% theory. So Guruji gave me 1% theory, which he really wanted me to practice. Within that 1% theory of Bandha, Ujjayi, Drishti, or structure, free breathing, focus, Pratihara, sense withdrawal, bringing the senses in to experience what we were doing. So just while we're on cause and effect, if we start the cause and effect from here, it can go breathing, it can go focus, which then better focus will give you as an effect better concentration. If better concentration becomes a cause, the effect is meditation. What Gaia has picked up on is that the clock or the wheel goes in both directions. But for most of us in the West, the concept of the yamas and the niyamas, especially if we don't have a, um, a, a religious connection or a, or a spiritual connection to start off with. So, in order to work this one out, uh, Gaia, we can do a different 
terminology. When Patabi Joyce then said to me, first you start on the third limb, then you go back. Okay? Then you go back. Why? What are we going to learn from the third limb? What I want to show you first before we go into that is the 99% practice, 1% theory. Is that most of us Westerners practice 110%. We over practice, we overwork. Our our society that we live in is full of habits and addictions. We've got programs of habits and addictions, and unfortunately, when we come into yoga, we bring in those habits and addictions. And so Patabi Joyce's theory was that if we put you into asana, one of the things you're going to learn about first is that you'll end up hurting yourself. Because I used to do 110% practice, meaning I would practice twice a day. And while I was practicing each time, I was practicing more than 100% because I was wanting to achieve. I was wanting to attain the next pose, the next series. Even before I knew there was a next series, I was trying to get the whole chocolate box on the day one. Okay, so if we make this a graph, I'm going to make this a graph that if I was saying that at first asana for me was, was that's where I'm starting and I'm doing 99% practice, only 1% theory, that means I don't really need to do much theory, I'm just going to do the practice and if I put my focus, it was sort of here. I was so far away from meditation. Okay, so if I was to make this into a graph, everything would be stretched up here. I won't draw it because it's not a whiteboard. If we then go, okay, let's have a look at the 1%, finally posture, free breathing, looking place filters through and go, oh, I'm actually doing a bit of posture, I'm doing a bit of breathing, I'm doing a bit of focus. Instead of having my center point there, I'm going to put it somewhere here. Now have a look at this. Here's my wheel of Ashtanga Yoga when I first started. I went from two practices a day, sore body, needing to have hot baths, lots of uh, tiger balm to ease my body out. If we have a look at this, This is called the Sukha. This is called the Sukha. So when we first use the word Sukha or hear the word Sukha used, it's used describing Arjuna's chariot. When Arjuna and Krishna were having their conversation, they were on Arjuna's chariot. And the Sukha refers to Arjuna's chariot used to run smooth and swift, providing a comfortable ride. That's the real first time it's used. But if we go into the inquiry, the Sukha was the axle hole that the craftsman or the builder that made Arjuna's chariot was so skilled at getting the center of the sukha, 
right in the center, the hub, sorry, the hub of the wheel right in the center so the wheel would run smooth and swift and comfortable. When the suka is off center, it creates dukkha. So this would be a real bumpy ride. Yeah. So when the actual hub center suka is not in the center, the wheel does not run smoothly, it creates a bumpy ride. So the very first thing that we learn is the first of yama. And the first of yama is ahimsa. And what's ahimsa? Kindness, Kindness nonviolence. I change it to love thyself. Ahimsa is non-violence, and so it's learning to love the self. We only hurt others when we are hurting ourselves. And we're hurting ourselves because others have hurt us. And that's just a vicious circle that goes on and on and on that we hurt other people because we're hurting ourselves because other people have been hurting us. The programs. The wrong programs. And so the yamas are what I call relationship codes, how we learn to relate to ourselves and how we then learn to relate to others. Guruji said, go back. The two words are action. So he knew that asana was also action. And for every action there is a reaction. So my wheel started to go backwards. So, the, so when we go in at asana, we've got two things happening. Cause and effect, action and reaction. So Gaia, it's the action reaction for those of us that don't have a spiritual background or a religious background or just a uh, having the concepts of loving thy neighbor, loving thyself and loving thy neighbor and having certain sort of moral codes that worked within the community. If you didn't have those moral codes, you were going to learn it, going cause and effect, action and reaction will take you back. So when you go back and start working on the five codes of Yama, it puts a different tension on this line. Yeah? At the moment, the tension's on these three. So if the tension on these three are pulling that way, can you see that? Let's just have a look again. Opposite asana is dhyana. And dhyana is meditation. If we look at meditation, if all you do and each day as a practice is sit, and so this is what's happened to the monks that no longer have a physical practice, they start to lose their posture. If you look at the opposite, if all you did was meditate, your graph or wheel would look like that. Huh? It's, still it's still dukkha. And so, what is a true sukha? As a balance, you've got to find the balance. So, Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga or Ashtanga Yoga is all eight limbs. 
It's not a bias on any one. Though any one of the asanas should bring you into relationship to all the other seven. So let's just have a look at this slightly different knee. Patabi Joyce's uh, posture free breathing looking place. So for me, the looking place is the sukha. And so we want to be looking from the sukha. When I looked at the meaning of the word sukha, I got axle hole. So hole was something that the axle went inside. But my mind then went, yeah, but a hole also is good for looking through. And so I then went from sukha, hole, to aperture. Because aperture is then something that you look through in terms a, of a camera lens. So the lens of consciousness is to look through your sukha. And that was all just my play on words from sukha to hole to aperture to lens to the lens of our consciousness. And Patabi Joyce was saying, looking place. And when he said it to me, what I felt from him was that. That it wasn't drishti. That it was to be looking from your center, your heart center. And so when I then further went to have a look at it, in fact, the, the Tibetan wheel, it looks like a sailing wheel. You'll probably recognize it when you see it now. It's, it looks like a a sailing wheel and it's got spokes so it looks like this, the, 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 the wheel of a sailing ship and it has of course all the sailing ships have a suka there for the wheel to spin on but if you zoom into the Tibetan one, so I'll zoom into that, make that bigger. It then has what I call the Rajasattva Tamas molecule, but it's actually like the yin and yang. And so when I see that, what do I see? Leaves of an aperture of a camera lens, closed, closed and open. So when we're getting the balance of the three gunas, we're wanting to transcend the elements. To transcend the elements, we've got to really control the senses. The senses, the elements, the elements, the gunas, the gunas to get to the the Prahrusha and the Prakriti. This is transcendental. We're trying to transcend, to devolve backwards. So in the wheel, the Ashtanga wheel concept is that we have the Sukha right in the center. And I then divided into five seeds, five seeds of practice. Those five seeds of practice are yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratihara. And what we'll find now is that asana comes as the base. It's the base of this wheel. And so for me, that's the foundation stone of Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga is asana. That's our rock. That's what we get back onto the mat every time we slip out of our, our Tadadrastu Swarupa, when we slip into Vritti Sarupim Itarata, into the contents of our mind. 
We've got to get back into our posture, free breathing and looking in place. So if we practice these five eights, five eights is definitely a tipping point. A tipping point or a turning point. Let's have a look at Niyama. Essentially, what is Niyama about? Okay, let me ask the question, Dalara, differently. What is Niyama to you? Not what's from the text or the teacher training. Please, everyone, start doing that. Start being your own sovereignty. Yes, there's texts out there, but what does it mean? If we just read it, if we're just told it, we still have to go, what does it mean to me? Integrity. It's for me, I'll share then with what it is for me, it's about cleansing. There's tapas. Yeah, that's the fire and the discipline. There's the salcha, which is the cleaning. Santosha is being content. You don't need to fill any more in there. And what's that? What's that? Self study. Self study. What's that? What is that? Non-attachment, no grasping. No covetous. Yeah. What's that? Translate it again. Uh, you don't want to get more than what you need. Yes. So for me, it's about the cleaning of the mind. So Santiago said Swadhaya. If you go into Swadhaya, the self-study, this is the real self-study one. You start doing asana and you start going back and you look at yourself. When you start going back and looking at yourself, you then start looking back at your relationship feed, feed, uh, fields. But this was this one here, cleansing. We're looking at what we're putting into ourselves, self-study. But the Svadhaya, if we go further into Svadhaya, it was chanting the um, ancient slokas. And what is chanting? Mantra do? Cleanses the mind. <coughs> so this is counted method. Yeah. So I put in my practice into my self study Ekam Dwe Trini Chatwari Pancha Shat. That by counting Ekam Dwe Trini Chatwari Shat, I am able to change my asana. Without the study of the self, I'm limited. Asana is limited. When the mind is unclean, you're limited. When the mind is clouded or full of desire or projection or stuck in the past with the doubts and the fear, we need to clear all that out. And so for me, in the niyamas, What's most important is the mantra for cleansing and purifying the mind. So we've got these five eights. If, if we're doing asana, that's one eighth. If we're doing asana and pranayama, synchronizing our breath, that's two eighths. If we're doing asana, pranayama, and let's say drishti, if we're just doing that, that's only three eighths. And it's possibly a, a reason why the practice doesn't really change much for people. So we talked about the practice being a practice to go inside rather than going out. 
this is still going out. Three-eighths of a practice, it's still possible for the ego to drive the direction of the practice. And so my proposition is, is that we need to get to the tipping point. So we've got one-eighth, two-eighths, three-eighths. If we go back and start looking at where we are in this practice, who we are in this practice, what we're doing in this practice, why we're doing this practice, we start to look at, well, where is the state of my mind? The state of my mind, I need to bring more focus and more clarity into my life. And the way I'm going to do that is through mantra, Swadhyaya. So when we start doing the counted method that we've been presenting you the last two weeks, I'm trying to bring your practice up to four eights. It's not a tipping point yet. Do you realize what I mean by tipping point? A turning point? That this is like walking up the steps. One, two, three. This is walking up the steps. So if you are only doing asana, pranayama, pratyahara, you are literally walking up the steps. We want to take the elevator. And the elevator happens at the turning point or the tipping point that when you get to five eights. So sometimes it's des described as there's four practices to do. Four practices. Pratihara is the one that's outside. I include Pratihara. But it's for me, when we start doing the mantra-based work, we really go back to where Gaia was really trying to direct us. Wouldn't the action, I mean the cause and effect, have a better cause and effect? And so what I found was that when I started on asana, Yes, my attitude was one thing, and the way I related was one thing. But when I then went back and started really looking at the yamas and the niyamas, and starting to go, well, what do they mean to me? What do they mean to me, and what do they mean to me in the way I then relate to myself and to others? And so just for you to understand that when we're practicing Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, we're not just practicing asana. That's the common error. We come to class to practice asana. It is the bait. It is what I call the front. Do you know what I mean by, by front? There's some shops that are fronts. What you're really going there is to buy some dope. But you, you, you see, that's the red light one. Yeah, you're going to the massage house parlor. <laughs> so, asana is just a front. We 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 bring you in. So, Patabi Joyce used to say that third series was just for demonstration. It was to draw people in. It's the front. Sure. To be able to put your leg here or your back there or, or this there and that there is just to bring people in. What we're really bringing you into is yama niyama. What we're really bringing you into is niyama. Our society has brainwashed us into competition, into self-gain, into, uh, what was that word that you had, Santiago? Aparigraha. Apa, apa, Aparigraha. You're wanting more is the opposite. Mm -hmm. We are producers and consumers, is what society has made us into. And so Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, or yoga, just the word yoga, is to find that union again, that community again, not the individualism. And so it's just a vehicle 
It's our rock. It's our vehicle for us to make a journey. As I describe them, is seeds. These are seeds of practice. Five seeds of practice, the first five limbs, and they produce, first of all, shoots. From shoots, maybe a leaf. From a leaf, maybe a bud. And then to a full blossom. These are the fruits of the practice. Dharana. The ability to concentrate. Dhyana. To go into absorption. To be absorbed in what you're doing. From concentration to be absorbed. When you're in absorption, then you're selfless. This is what it means to me, Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga. So, in these theory classes or philosophy classes, yes, I've read sutras, read philosophy books. But each time I read and reflect, I go, what does it mean to me? And in the process of doing that, discovered this beautiful context, that this is the sukha. This is where we want to be finding our balance. That when all this happens, and the sukha is totally balanced, when I was doing 99% asana, my sukha was like that, off center. Now, if I look at my hole through here, all I can see is a ceiling tile. And so if I look like that, my sense of reality in this room is a ceiling tile. If my bias is so out of balance, I've got to change the aperture and reposition the aperture to be able to take in a greater reality. So the more continuous that we practice with the devotion and the commitment to it, the sweeter the practice becomes if we're doing five-eighths of a practice. <laughs>